good good evening to all present we consider ourselves extremely fortunate to have for today's eml mini a reputed historian journalist and author shri subhaya mutaya please give him a big hand i'd like to begin by inviting uh, miss preeti ahalyam to welcome shri subhaya with the fruit basket Shri Subhaya Mutaya was the foreign news editor then features editor of the Times of Ceylon from 1951 to 1968. He was associated with Ceylon from London News Chronicle, the London Daily Mail and the Observer. He was later the editor of TTK Group's prize winning house journal TTK Spectrum. From 1999 he has been a regular columnist with the Hindu Chennai writing mainly on the city's heritage particularly of people from the past in a monday column called monday madras miscellany he is also the author of 35 books with historical backgrounds including madras Re- rediscovered additionally he has taught at the bharatiya vidya bhavan anna technological university and the university of madras he was awarded the mbe by the queen of england in march 2002 for his work on heritage and environment conservation in madras I'd like to now call upon Sri Subhaya to deliver his, le- his lecture. Officially, this has been titled, How Aware Are You of Heritage? Uh, how aware? Tell me, how aware are you? Come on, I want a response. Nobody is aware of heritage. Is that what I take it to mean? Come. Little bit. Anybody else? Little more than that. Otherwise, how are you going to get on in this lecture? Eh? I am not a classroom teacher. Okay, we are getting nowhere on this thing. Let's see if we get somewhere else with a bit of storytelling. How many of you in this room have done history, geography. Hold on a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. The question is a trick question. How many of you have done history, geography, civics, and what they call environmental studies today as separate subjects for at least five years? How many of you are from CBSCs? Surely you must have done it. Why didn't you tell me that you had done it? Counting. Right? You are counting. Right? That means less than one third of this class had done these as separate subjects. Two thirds have done this under this fancy title called Social Studies taught by an arithmetic teacher. Right? And that to me is why you are not aware of heritage. I did from standard 2, my, my senior Cambridge was standard 9, so I did 7 years of it as separate subjects. And I've never forgotten that. It made a big difference to those of us who were brought up that way that era. Today in this country, apart from CBSE schools and maybe ICSC, all state board schools teach this magic subject called social studies and insist you concentrate on arithmetic, geometry, biology or something like that. And the rest of the world can go to hell as far as they are concerned. And that to me is a tragedy. Now let's get closer home to you. I went to college in America, undergrad. I too did engineering and I know nothing about engineering. Let me assure you of that. I did four years of engineering college. I know nothing about engineering. But I got through engineering for one very simple reason. The American undergraduate course gave me 40% of humanities. 40% of my credits were humanities. 
And I think every American engineer is the better for it. They become better engineers if they do their masters or whatever it is or go into the industry. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, I think most IITs, I don't think, go into industry to that extent. They're looking at ITs and other management areas and things like that. They're not really looking at engineering per se as engineering. And I think that has been the advantage of America in that sense, that they have looked at a much wider scale and much broader thinking of what it is. As I said, I got through because I had 40% engineering and we had groups of three doing practical subjects and I wrote the reports for all three and I did the best reports possible. So I got through. That's the way to get through in American colleges. But the fact is, I think we were broader minded because of it. We see a world which is much beyond the world that we were taught to. And I think that is where we need to look at. I would strongly advocate a complete changing pattern, not only of school education, but of IIT education, where you need to look at a much wider area of uh, the humanities and things like that to be aware of the world that, work, that you're working in. Such. Now you can turn around to me and ask me, quite justifiably, why should we look at heritage? Why should we look at history or geography? I can certainly say if you're a civil engineer, you should be looking at geography for a long time and everything connected with it. I think you should be looking at environmental studies if you're connected with it. Many of your fields connect up with this. But the question, broadly speaking, which people talk about is, why should we look at heritage? What is, what is special about heritage? So let's see if we can find a definition for heritage. And I'm going to ask a few of you, and for God's sake, don't be shy. Eh? Answer me, please. What is heritage? How would you define heritage? Anyone? Broadly speaking, material or immaterial things which we get, which get passed on to generations. That's all. But the traditions and beliefs that uh, uh, passed on from from generations to generations, which help us to evolve, uh, you know, more morally, ethically, scientifically, and. So, in that sense, I, I feel that this is our heritage. It's a very good answer, except I write it in simpler language. I don't know any word beyond two syllables. Anybody else on this side? You know, the theory. You look at Oxford Dictionary, you look at Chambers, you look at any other dictionary, Webster's or whatever you want, and heritage is never defined precisely. Yours is a far better definition than what most of the dictionaries say. This is a very uncertain subject. My own definition, if I would look at it, is that I'm echoing your words in some ways. That which has been cherished, protected, and passed down to us by our forefathers, and which we need to cherish, protect, and pass down in as good a condition as possible to our descendants in order that they may take pride in the society that they are descended from and into. Heritage to me is part and parcel of our everyday lives. What my forefather passed on to me, if they are values which are worthwhile, I need to pass on to my children and my grandchildren. And it is not merely that we are looking at a brick building. 
it encompasses a whole lot of areas as such. And that is what we need to look at in terms of heritage, is not merely the concept of tradition or something like that. I'm looking at a whole range of other things. To me, heritage would include man-made heritage at one level and natural heritage at the other level. And if you look at man-made heritage, what would you include in that? Hmm? Buildings. Buildings. They are all buildings. <coughs> Music and art. Festivals. Yeah. Festivals. Festivals. Scriptures. Hmm? scriptures. Scripture. Religious thinking. Yes, scriptures. Scientific advancements. Religious, cultural, architectural, literature, the artistic, the historical, there is a whole range of things that we are looking at as man-made heritage. They all need protection if you are going to pass them on from your generation to the next generation and which came down to you because somebody protected you at some point in time as such. Whether it is religion or whether it is a building or whatever it is. Tanjaur Vyadeshwara Temple is a thousand years old. It needed protection to come down all this way as such. Whether it is Islam or Christianity or Hinduism, they've needed protection for them to be passed on to you in, over the years. Whether it is Shakespeare or the Mahabharata or Ramayana, they needed protection to come down to you today. All that is part of our heritage and we can't say no to it. The problem is we tend to think of there's something around the corner. But the fact is, all our lives we have learned so many things, but we never think that we need to protect it to pass it on to somebody else. And if you look at natural heritage, what are we talking about? Hmm? Biodiversity, three syllables, much beyond me. Come, 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 come. What is biodiversity? Flora and fauna. It's around you every day. Lakes, tanks, rivers. See what we are doing to the Adair and the Kuvam. They are a heritage. How many of you ever want to protect the Kuvam or the Adair? How many people want to protect trees or do something with trees or generate trees? There's a whole world of things like rivers, lakes, tanks, forests, groves, herbal wealth, wildlife, mineral wealth. Mineral wealth we are gobbling. One day there will be a world without minerals. That is heritage. Somebody left it to us. And we are using it up instead of trying to conserve it. So heritage is not a very simple thing that we tend to look at uh, in terms of just a building that you need to save or whether you should chop down three trees in uh, IIT campus or not. That is really not it's a much wider subject that we need to look at. And much of this in the past, so they tell me, was done by kings because we were not, to me India became India only on January 26, 1950. India may have been a geographical entity of sorts, it may have been a cultural entity of even wider sorts, but in terms of a political united country, the day we became January 26, 1950, that is India to me. You go back thousand years and we are looking at Chola kingdoms, Pandya kingdoms, Chera kingdoms, Pallava kingdoms. We are looking at Rajasthan built into so many states. We are looking at the whole country divided into so many years. Have you ever thought about it that on August 14th, 1947, if you looked at a map of India, 
only half the map was covered imperial pink. The other half of the map was yellow with three, something like 600 boundary lines in it. All that vanished only on January 26, 1950. So in this question of fragmentation, where you had small little states and things, if you had a good king, he looked after your heritage. And if you had a bad king, he didn't look after your heritage. Fortunately for us in many ways, and you think about this, about the only heritage the ancients have left to us in terms of built heritage is temples. How many forts of the ancients? Can you find the remnant of a, Chemna, uh, of a Chola fort? Can you find the remnant of uh, Pandya King fort? The temples remain because palaces of worship were respected. But in terms of social life, societal life, which includes urban cities and things covered by walls, which are really what the forts are as such, you find virtually nothing. And this has gone through the ages as such, because we haven't protected it. We haven't protected knowledge. Let me give you two or three instances of what I'm talking about. Dear Deshwara temple, the big temple, thousand years old, magnificently built temple, no question about it. Built in an area where there is no granite. There is no granite within 150 kilometers of that area. How was it done? They say there is a coping stone on top with several of several ton weight. How did it get there? Who was the architect who built it? You will tell me Raja Raja Chola built it. He didn't build it. He paid for it. Who built it? Can you give me one plan of how that was built? Today you are all engineers. You are all drawing plans all the time. Hopefully those plans are put away somewhere. If I go to the Tamil Nadu, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, PWD office, plans of 50 years ago are not no longer there. They build buildings with plans and then the plans vanish. If I go to the British Library or the British Architects, I can get plans 200, 300, 400 years old. To me, that is saving heritage. And we have not done. Our knowledge has vanished. Take another case. Grand Anikat. How many of you all have heard of the Grand Anikat? Know where it is? Trichy, right? close to Trichy. Arthur, Co Arthur Cotton, who built the Godavari and Krishna dams, which are considered masterpieces of modern dam building, saw the Grand Anikat and said that he can never build a dam like that. It was such a marvel. Where are the plans? Where is the knowledge? How was it done? Thousand years later and more, it's still working. Take my old territory, Sri Lanka or Ceylon, as I knew it. It had one of the world's great hydraulic civilizations. The whole of the north central area, which is a dry area, had tanks built and it had channels which had such a microscopic slope. No engineer today and I was friends with one of the leading irrigation engineers at that time, could understand how they got these slopes to feed the area. So this is what I'm talking about when I say there was this world of knowledge that we had. And we have lost it. And we continue to lose it because we are not doing anything about it. Because you are not looking beyond the fact that 
I will look at engineering as, as engineering as per se, or I look at accountants as accountancy as per se, or I look at business management as business management as per se. You are not looking at what can come down from you to somebody else as part of a heritage. And I think that's a very, very sad state of affairs. Nevertheless, and I think whether we like it or not, mainly thanks to the British, over 300 years or so of history, there has been some kind of protection of ancient monuments and ancient structures. Let me assure you, Grand Anakat would have vanished long, long ago if the British hadn't been protecting it. The temple might have stayed. But the hydraulic civilization of Sri Lanka would have vanished if it hadn't been for the British protection. But to a great extent, thanks to a British period, there has come into being various organizations which protect heritage in some sort of way. They may not have the money to protect everything, but there is a level of governmental protection today. How much of it is enforced or not is a different question. We can argue on all these issues. But at least in principle, we have things like the Botanical Survey of India, the Zoological Survey of India, the Archaeological Survey of India, the Anthropological Survey of India. Virtually all of them first started in Madras. And these surveys, to some extent, within their limitation, have managed a level of protection of heritage. And if today you go around and look at the Grand Anakat or one of the forts of Jaipur or whatever it is, I think you need to owe these pioneers of these surveys a great deal as such for their protection as such. Otherwise, a lot of this would have vanished. But remember, what little has been protected, so much more has vanished. And that is really the tragedy. Now, we can't bring that back. But at least what we have, we need to save further. Now, people involved in this so-called heritage movement, which looks at environment to some extent, looks at built heritage to a greater extent, because that gets the most publicity as such. Uh, cultural heritage is well and good. Culture, tradition and things and religion and all, we look after ourselves. They are all protected reasonably well. Uh, but even culture, we begin to wonder because uh, Temples, for instance, come under uh, HRNC, Hindu religious and uh, whatever the term is, and they don't do a very good job of it. Right. But anyway, there's some level of protection for culture and all these things. But certainly in built heritage and environmental heritage, we do a very bad job as such. Now, what we've been looking at, how much can government really protect? Right. They have limitations of funds, and even if you pour in funds, just look at a little place like Madras. Supposing, this is purely supposing, right? I think if you list within Madras, city which has now expanded its limits, uh, you will find about what might be listed as 1,200 heritage buildings. I know we have listed 650 heritage buildings within the city itself. If we go beyond the city and things, we'll probably list another 500, 600. 1,200 heritage buildings, assuming that they're all public buildings, which they're not. Where is the money to protect them? You're not going to find that kind of money unless you do it yourself. So there has to be a certain level of funding and commitment by the individual in all these cases. However, we work it out. I mean, there are so many problems into all this, and I'm not going into all the problems. But I'm just raising it as a thought that if you need, you can't go around protecting everything under the sun. But you do need to protect what you think is important as such. And that is where we begin to look at the whole concept of this heritage preservation. Heritage preservation, 
better term to me is conservation. Because preservation is a static concept. You preserve and keep it there. Conservation is a live concept that you save the building for use after that. Or whether it's a building or a tank or whatever you're going to conserve or a forest or whatever it is for use. In this context, if you look at it, uh, where are we headed today in terms of preservation? Let me look at a couple of examples of this whole thing. We have basically been in the Madras heritage movement and this is uh, nationwide, the so-called heritage movement, not a very strong movement, but still there. Began to realize one thing, that the whole concept of heritage preservation is a very good recent concept. It's as recent as post-World War II. There have been these surveys and things as we talked about which go back to the 18th and 19th centuries which have done certain amount of preservation. But the real consciousness and where the word heritage became popularized came after World War II. And it came after one single incident. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's something related, okay. Yeah. Stolen, right. We're so getting close. It was the bombing of by the allies of Dresden Cathedral. One of the most famous architectural feats in Europe at the time. It was bombed by the allies and today a half finished building has been restored and restored beautifully. But that one single event added to all these things, art things lost and all the things you are talking about, began to make a consciousness of heritage. And that is when we began to think of much later that while the past of before 500 years is being preserved, while we are looking at ancient temples and things like that, the buildings which we live in, name the buildings, Chepok Palace, General Post Office, High Court, all in daily use till the fires which mysteriously turn up. All of them in use are not looked after. And this is true right through the country. That is when the heritage movement in India began to look at that these need to be revived, that these buildings have lives. I got involved in this in a very peculiar way. As I said, I'm a very bad engineer. I shouldn't have ever passed engineering. Uh, I'm not a historian. All my life I've been a journalist. Uh, but uh, I got involved in the way I think everybody should get involved. The first half of my life I spent in Ceylon, of which 20 years I was a journalist. During those 20 years, I traversed, there were a gang of five of us, I was a happy bachelor in those days, and the five of us traversed every inch of the island. Every weekend we take the jeep out and go out somewhere. So off the beaten track all the time. And we found all sorts of things all over the place. We found a place called Tantri Malay, which is like Mahabalipuram, abandoned in mid-stroke. Now, have you ever thought of Mahabalipuram? If you go and look at Mahabalipuram, work was abandoned in mid-stroke, literally. No part of Mahabalipuram is finished. You go and see a carving, you'll find half the year is there, the other half is not there. Why did it happen? We don't know. But we found places like that. And that is how I began first getting interested in heritage that there were all these mysteries which were floating around the place, a part of very much a Ceylon history and which we knew nothing about. Later, when I came to Madras, 
I began to discover the same sort of things in Madras. And being from Chetinad, I began to find the same things in Chetinad. Ancient houses, not very old, 200 years, beautifully done mansions, in rack and ruin because nobody is looking after them. Do you realize in Chetinad, for instance, those of you who have any awareness of Chetinad, 40% of the houses have been pulled down. Out of the other 60%, 80% are not maintained. Yet, we call it a heritage town. The Tamil Nadu government has decreed it a heritage destination. Where the heritage is vanished? Because nobody has looked after it. And I think this is really the tragedy that we are really looking at as such. Now, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Can we do anything? Can any one of you do anything? I know I'm very glad that in this campus there has been established a thing called the Heritage Conservation Training Center or whatever it is. Meant to train people to conserve, work in conservation and things like that. I was very happy to go and preside over recently, just a week ago, and for the first time a dialogue between the heritage movement and the corporation of Chennai, where 83 engineers sat through three days and listened to the bullshit we were talking. But they sat through. And if out of the 83, five people got something out of it, I'd be very happy. But that's what we need to. That we have to sit down and somehow get the knowledge going. And it's not merely knowledge. In that it happens that I'm involved in built heritage. But I'm looking at environmental heritage. For years we've been talking about. I came to Madras in 68. The first time I heard a plan to save the Kuvam and the Adaya were in 69. There was a British company called Seven Trent who had done the Thames. They came up with a plan, money was sanctioned and money vanished. But not into the Adaya or the Kuvam. Four times money has been sanctioned. Four times, including the latest sanction. And the Adair and the Kuvam remain the same as they are. That is our heritage. Now who is going and campaigning for it? As, as I said, lone voices like ours campaign and everybody says we are bloody fools. But anyway, we have been going on for how many years? For 30 years or 40 years now. But hopefully there will be some people who will begin to realize. I think one of the happiest things, as far as I'm concerned, I, I told you I'll wander all over the place, uh, is Madras week. We started with a half-day celebration. Three of us were involved in it. It grew over the last 12 years from a half-day celebration to a week and now virtually a month. Certainly it was packed to a fortnight. And every bit of it was spontaneous. Every bit of it was voluntary. And that to me is a, some sort of creation of awareness. And it wasn't merely history, it was a whole range of things. It was food walks. Tell me, how many of you all went on any of the heritage walks? How many? One person. How many of you went on any of the nature walks? One, two people. Where are we? How many of you went on the food walks? No one. For God's sake, discover your own city. Eh? Forget anything else. Become aware of the city where you live. Now, this is where I blame institutions like this. 
there is no effort made to look beyond the walls of this paradisal campus. There is a living city out there. How many of you all have been to North Madras? Six or seven, not bad. When out of 50 people here, six or seven go, it's not bad. We have reached that point. North Madras is where this city began. If you are engineers today, you owe it to North Madras. You know that industry in the city began only in North Madras. Name one industrial unit in North Madras. Anyone? The major industries were in the city in North Madras. Name them to me. Mini and Carnatic Mills. They're a little older than this crowd, I think. <laughs> Name another one. That is recent. And look at the where engineering really began in the city. Huh? Port to some extent. Huh? That's comparatively recent. Hmm? Tari as a trading company, but not as a thing. The railway workshop, the Perambur workshop is one of the biggest railway workshops in the country. That's what drew eventually into the ICF eventually, where the workshop still remains. There was a whole range of things that we have forgotten all about it. How many of you all have visited the railway museum? One, two. Where are we? You see the point I'm making on this whole thing? That I think we all need to look at what is around us. And tomorrow, and I'm assuring of this because I know it, my children and my grandchildren are all like that. Right? I go, I have a daughter who shares a wall with Apple, literally. Right? You take her out of Silicon Valley and IT and she's into nanotechnology or something. Take her out of that field and she knows nothing. Till I come there and say, let's go. When you go to any Indian family or South Asian family or whoever it is you see in that part of the world and the same story. They are in their little niches. But you meet an American and he will tell you the history of Silicon Valley. All of, half of you will wind up in Silicon Valley in this room. Do you know what Silicon Valley was before it became Silicon Valley? Do you even look at it before you go? It was the orchard of America. All of what was orchards, plums and peaches and pears and whatever you want. It was farming country. Today you don't find a farm in a way. You have to go further north to Sacramento and Yuba Valley and find the Sikhs who settled a hundred years ago have become the biggest food farmers in America. To me, it's a fascinating story if you would get involved in these things. And you want to preserve it in some sort of way. You need to tell the children your stories. You need to tell your grandchildren the stories. But how many of us do when we look at the job? The focus is only on the job. And that's a sad thing to me. So where have we gone in Madras? As I said, I was told not to talk about Madras, but since Madras is what I best know, has there been any progress? Yes, as I said, Madras week, Madras fortnight, as somebody said it will soon be a Madras season to match the music season. Yes, it has made some progress. On the heritage front, when it comes to environment, 
nil progress. Absolutely nil progress. <coughs> Cultural heritage, well looked after. Music season, dance season, religious festivals, the whole works. Madras is the hub of India. Great, great show. But comes to environment, we are absolutely nil. And I'm not merely looking at environment in terms of a river or a tank or a lake or something. Just look at your street. Can't we look at our streets? There was a famous organization here called Exnora, which still survives. If you were a member of Exnora on this street, you cleaned your stuff on this street and put it on the next street, which is not next door. That's us. That's the way we are. But environment nil. Building wise, fortunately, there has been some progress. Now, in the case of buildings, and like most other things, you need a law, you need act. And for 20 years, we've been trying to get a Heritage Act passed. 20 years ago, I was part of the drafting committee with the town and country planning department and we drafted the law. It was only last year that it was passed. Nothing has been implemented ever since. The law is forgotten. A few years ago, just before the law got passed, they established something called the Heritage Conservation Committee. They listed, I was on a committee called the E. Padmanaman Committee, of the, appointed by the High Court, and we identified 600 odd buildings here, which should be free of hoardings and all that, and some sort of protection should be given to them. Using this list, the Heritage Committee wrote to everybody else, all 600 people said, before you do anything to your building, let us know. That was the end of the story. Neither did anybody let them know, and the others just happily pulled down whatever they wanted, and nobody could do anything about it. The act has come, which now enforces it, all these things. No act is in place. Despite that, there has been progress, even by the government. And that's, to some extent, Work has gone on on Ripon Building, the municipal headquarters, Victoria Public Hall next door, or the town hall as it is called, as work has gone on. And other buildings have also been to some extent, I can name half a dozen buildings. But I want to take the case of one particular building, one of the first that we got around to. Senate House of one of the premier universities of India, one of the first three universities in the East to be established. Senate House was considered a marvel of architectural conception. Somehow, through a VC who was very interested in saving the building, and a few public spirited people, we managed to get the money. And the building was well repaired, well restored. It was a good job of restoration as such. Before it was restored, it was in shambles. You won't believe the kind of, if I showed those pictures, you won't believe it was in that state. And it was used to store exam papers and any other kind of junk that you wanted, it was stored. It was restored. Mr. B.C., who saved the building, finished his term and went out. Four VCs have come since then, and the building is still under lock and key, and still used for storage. And if anybody wants to look at the building, they come and remove all the exam papers and then put them back again. It's one of the great buildings of India. Seven crores were spent on restoring it. And this is its state today. And this in an educational institution. Premier educational institution. To 
me the moral of the story is very simple. You can restore any number of buildings as you want. All it needs is money. And it needs good people committed to good conservation practices. If originally Chudam was used, you must use Chudam again. If originally brick was used or rock was used, you need to use the things again. Those are basic practices which you need to look at. But having done that, once the building is saved, what do you do? What should you do? Hmm? More than maintenance. Huh? Put it to use. Buildings must live. You can't keep it locked up. By keeping that building locked up, you go and see it. It's almost back to the original state before we started. The old reading hall of the Kadamara Library, beautiful building, really outstanding building. They restored it beautifully, kept under lock and key. Nobody can enter it. If you want anything from that building, write a note and hopefully you will get it. Hopefully. Otherwise you don't get anything. That has begun to deteriorate. So unless you use things and maintain it, if you maintain these buildings, they last another 200 years. Today's buildings, which all of you build, is 40 years. And from 40 years onwards, they'll all start deteriorating. My house is built by one of the leading builders here. It's now almost 40 years. It's begun to deteriorate. And that is the standard formula. They say 30 to 40 years, you better start looking after your house. These are buildings 200 years and 300 years old. And will last another 200, 300 if they're maintained. But we don't. And then nothing we can do about it. And to me, a lot of this, certainly, and I go back to my basic theme with which I started. It needs knowledge, at least in terms of appreciation and awareness. It must come through schools and colleges and education. It can't come through anything else. My answer today is that I would like to start it at school itself. The other day, I listened to, to an extremely good lecture. And you might like to have him here someday. A father, Vijay Kiran, a Roman Catholic priest who is as passionate about heritage as I am. Uh, his doctoral thesis, Viva, I went to, and he made a brilliant presentation of what is happening to churches, Roman Catholic churches. 1,200 churches in Tamil Nadu, he's visited every one, 450 of them dating to before 1947. And he says how badly they've been kept. His last parish church is St. Anthony's at Pudupet, which he has restored beautifully. And he was getting this message across through his viva as such. And at this place, after the viva, which was a brilliant presentation, a beautifully speaking priest who obviously was very cultured and educated, elderly, now retired, says, why do you want old churches? Why can't we build a new church? And I felt like asking, why can't we change Jesus into somebody else new? Because that should be, I mean, this building is there. It is beautifully done. Why do you want to knock it down? just because you can do it cheaper, a new thing. And build a building which has St. Peter's Dome on it, as we are doing in all over the city. Look at almost every new church which is coming up in the Roman Catholic diocese, all with St. Peter's Dome on them. So this is where we stand. There are people who just don't want to do it. But here is a man who has sort of passionately looked at this whole thing. And you are glad that somebody is going thinking about it and is hoping that he'll get it done. But there are very few people like this who are really interested in this. A similar case came up some years ago. Anyone know what were the first 
purpose built building for a cinema theatre in Madras. Purpose built. Nobody? Huh? Close to the casino. Huh? It is in the Mount Road Post Office compound. The small little building which was called the Electric Theatre and was used by the Mount Road Post Office for years. It was getting worse and worse and worse till we had a postmaster general who again was interested in heritage. He restored the building and today it is the philatelic bureau and it is an exhibition hall for stamps and things like that and it is in use and therefore the building is well kept and well maintained. This is what is called adaptive reuse. Save the building and use it for whatever purpose, make a restaurant of it, do whatever. You go to Europe every day. You go to Stockholm, for instance, on the seafront on Stockholm. All the exteriors are as they were 600 years ago. You go inside, they are all smart offices, more than smart than anything else in India. But the building outside and the whole structure is 600 years old, matching with the palace which is next door. They are used for different purposes today, in old, old homes, but they have been saved. So you go to Sweden, you look at Stockholm, you look at the palace and you see all this around you and say, what a wonderful job, how nice it all looks. But when you come to Madras and go along Rajaji Sale and have all along uh, NSE Bose Road and have all these nice buildings, but you don't see any of them because they are so badly kept. So there has to be, it is not that they belong to government, it is not belong to that. It is the citizenry who are failing half the time. And the citizenry are failing because they don't have the studies or the educational background to appreciate this. And I think that is what needs to be changed. And when Father Kiran spoke that day, I, he said, we will start in school. I said, Father, you don't need to start in school. Every Catholic priest goes to a seminary. The ones who go to the seminaries are going to become parish priests today, tomorrow. Two years or three years at the seminaries where you should be teaching this as one of the subjects. And I say today, IIT should be teaching it as one of the subjects in every stream of education. It's too late to go back to school today. But certainly at your level you could start teaching. And this is where I say the humanities has to come in much more into play than what we are talking about. One last story. Down on Rajaji Sale, there was a building called Bentinck's building. Any of the old timers remember this building? It was the collectorate, it was the collector's office on Rajaji Sale. A wonderful piece of classical European architecture. It was built for what was called the Supreme Court of Madras at that time. Over the years it became the collectorate of Madras. Uh, when the High Court was built, the courts moved out from there, then it became the collectorate and was used by government as such. When it, one fine day, the government decided, perfectly good building, they were going to pull it down and build a 10-story collectorate. They had nothing in 10 stories on that stretch of thing, but they were going to build a 10-story thing. Then we protested against this. MJ was chief minister. He said, no, we are going ahead. Indira Gandhi was prime minister. We managed to get to Indira Gandhi. She spoke to him. And it was agreed they won't pull it down. Instead, what did they do? Guess. Yeah? Yeah, they just emptied it. They completely emptied it. Not a soul was there except the vandals and the 
tongues and all who came and settled in, in the empty space. And the building gradually deteriorated. And when they thought they had deteriorated enough, the PWD in his wisdom condemned the building. This was 10 years later. Good enough now to pull the building down. It took 18 months to pull that building down. Each pillar took 15 days to pull down. That was how solid the building was. But it went eventually. And this is what tends to happen. Fortunately, now there seems to be a little more consciousness and we are beginning to do things a little better as such. But there has been this thinking that we can constantly pull down. We have Chepak Palace, magnificent building. One building caught fire. They said they were going to restore it. The money has been sanctioned. It's almost two years now, nothing has been done. Meanwhile, the next building has caught fire. Nothing has been done. So you have a lack of government will in many of these things on one side. And at the same time, you have public apathy on the other side. Now, I can't do anything about government will. But I certainly think the public should begin to look at, in terms of those people who can take some decisions and do something, begin to look at the field of education in a much more positive way, that people become more and more aware of this, and that we begin to save our heritage, whether it is natural heritage, like our rivers, our tanks, whether it is our built heritage, cultural heritage, if it is losing, and a lot of our cultural heritage is losing. Bharatanatyam, we are protecting. What happens to folk dance? What happens to Terikutu? Where is it going? You can think of any number of cultural heritage aspects which are vanishing. Anything which is vaguely thought of being tied up with religion is saved. But if it's not tied up with religion in culture, then you are good chance that it's going to be lost as such. So we need to look at can we teach our children, our adults, whether they are in a seminary or whether they are in a college, can we teach them to be a little bit aware of the world around them? Not merely by lecturing. I think we should go for heritage walks, we should go for nature walks, you should go on your own to discover North Madras, to discover Georgetown. How many of you have been to Georgetown? I can name six, seven people. How many others? Where are they? Discover Georgetown. That is where the money in the city still is today. If today you are employed in a business, business site or an engineering thing, that money came from Georgetown. But you never think about it. So long as your salary check comes, you don't wonder where it came from. This, I think, is my plea to all of you all. Begin to look at this city or whatever city you are going to tomorrow. You can work in Ranchi tomorrow. It has a history. You can work in Chandigarh tomorrow. It has a history. You can work in Trivandrum tomorrow. It has a history. Till you know that history, its geography, its environment, you will be able to do something for that city. You will appreciate it. Otherwise, I think in many ways, you will remain a vegetable. Thank you all very much. spoke about we we have you know uh, currently towards our heritage uh, has it always been there traditionally or historically i mean among indians that one of the sad things is that we have as indians we have no sense of history our history to a great extent
is myth and legend. No, no harm. I have no problem with it. But at the same time, we have no recorded history and want, don't want to have a recorded history. Whether it is the Indian psych or whatever you want to call it, recorded history has never really been our strong point. Now, to give you a small example in today's world, I just mentioned Perry and Company, 250 year old company. I wrote the history of the company and I had access to its archives. It has minute books dating from day one. And those minute books during the European era, beautifully handwritten, real calligraphic handwritten, big notebooks, 20, 30 pages for every board meeting with every detail discussed. The day the company became Indian, we have one typewritten sheet with three paragraphs on it pasted in the book. Now you tell me, who values history more? A minute book is the record, it's a history of your company. And this is true of any company. There are exceptions. Tata Group is one exception. There are exceptions. But by and large, if you look at Indian companies, this is the attitude. And this is the attitude of Indian people. And has gone on. As I said, we have no record of Bredeshwar Temple. We have no record of anything really in any, any place. As such. You look at the inscriptions. Everybody says we have inscriptions. Inscriptions say Raja Raja Chola did this. Raja Raja Chola did that. He gave this amount of land to so and so. He gave so and so to land. How did this temple get built? He not said. He built the temple. Social history is not our history. And that is the tragedy of it. And I am saying we need to change it. How many of you all have visited this uh, IIT Heritage Center? Less than half the class. <laughs> what does one say to that? Huh? Yeah, it's locked also. I heard that today. Why it's locked, I have no idea. But anyway, but I'm sure if you ask for it to be opened, it'll be open. Yeah. I'm sure it will be. In fact, keeping it locked is obviously a suspicion that it won't be the maintained the same way it is if it was opened. But I, I, I mean, just think of it. I'm, I'm not saying anything, but uh, it, it needs to. Think of when, who was your first uh, director? IIT Madras, first director? Sen Gupta. What is Sen Gupta best known for? Yeah. Sen Gupta Gap. Sen Gupta Gap. Sen Gupta Gap. Gap. Okay, that's fine. That's your thinking. My thinking is the way he protected the trees while the campus was being built. It was legendary the way he protected those trees when the campus was built. You see, our value system, this system is different, mine is different. But if today you have this thing, whether the gap helps or not, I don't know. But certainly the, the trees have helped you, give you a better campus than most colleges have. Yeah. I'll tell you a very simple thing. Forget all the natural heritage. A common man can keep the area around his house clean. That's as simple as that. Don't throw your garbage outside the door or something like that. See that the area where you live in is a clean area. That is healthy, hygienic or whatever it is. You can join movements. There are plenty of movements which you can join. That's a different thing. I'm not even advocating that. I'm saying just on the simplest level, can we have a cleaner, more hygienic city? Can we do that? Go to North Madras and see how filthy the damn place is. But that was where the city began. Today you are here because of that North Madras, but see how ghastly the whole place is. And we carry on doing all sorts of things. I mean, that whole Ennore area, we have put in power stations, we are putting shipping yards, we are putting all sorts of things, pristine land which is now going to 
and we put these up. But are we seeing anything about what is happening to the waste or the refuse or whatever is happening? We don't do that. We empty it into the rivers or the sea or whatever it is. So, to me, if you can, as a common man, keep your area clean. If you want to do a little more, there are plenty of organizations. If you're interested in trees, there's an organization called Niller, doing wonderful work. Believe it or not, Niller has now gone into the prisons. And all Tamil Nadu prisons are do now doing gardening, and they've opened shops to sell the produce. Small organization, not more than 15 members or 20 members. Dedicated leader, they've gone prison by prison, supported by, at that time, the chief of prison. Every prison gardener, there are plenty of land, everything has a garden. Now they're beginning to look at, since they have 100 acres somewhere, they're looking, beginning to look at growing millet and selling millet. Right. It can be done. And not, these people in this, 15 people, are all middle class people, not one person who is known anywhere. But they do it. So there are plenty of organizations. You can join one of these organizations. There are plenty of that. But a, merely keeping a place clean is something which I think is worth looking at. Yeah. Which is? I, I didn't follow your question. Uh, like social do the social evils which have come down, do, do they also form a part of the Social evils which come down? Like, it's part of your heritage. And it's heritage which you need to change. But at the same time, many of these have evolved. You said dowry. <laughs> no, no, she, she said dowry. Okay. <laughs> she said dowry, okay. Uh, in my community, at one time, many, many years ago, we paid bright price. It evolved into dowry. So it changes. Right? But all these things are happening. And there will be 101 evils in society. There will be a lot of good things in society as such. Despite your saying evil is a dowry, we had till recent years had a fairly good community. In recent years, many other things have happened, including education. And now we have one of the highest divorce rates going. <laughs> yeah. How do you choose what to preserve? Because I am from a city. So, Fort was pulled down 150 years ago. One of the best planned cities in South India. With the absence of a fort, you cannot even imagine the plan of the city. So, uh, somebody chose to pull the fort down 150 years back. So, nobody really has seen that fort, obviously. So, our image of the city is totally different. So, yes, of course, we get something. But we do change also. So, how do we choose what to preserve and what not? One is simply by law. Right? There is a true laid down formula by which you can identify buildings on different counts. We are looking only at buildings. But the law can be wider in terms of natural heritage also. But in terms of for simplicity sake, let's stick to buildings. There are groups which are formed, which have people of the ideal constitution, which we had drafted, had 11 members with the 11 forms of expertise. Historical expertise, architectural expertise, engineering expertise, and so on and so forth to be called a heritage conservation, a conservation committee and who would identify the buildings and then recommend whether they, they should be class 1, class 2, class 3. Class 1 building you can't do anything except preserve it. Class 2 you can adapt it. Class 3 you can do a little more. But this was done by a, com by, done by a committee. It is, and the theory is then you have to publicize it. There has to be an open hearing and at the end of the day it is, once it is listed that listing starts. That is one way of doing it, that you do it by law. Right? The other, and this covers a number of sins in the sense that the building does not have to be merely architectural. It does not have to be merely uh, 50 or 100 years old. That is not a criteria. Today, MJR's house or Kamaraja's house 
a heritage building because those buildings had people of significance living in them and they are memorial. That's something I didn't mention uh, when I was talking about my involvement of this whole thing. I'd like to expand on that a little. As I said, I was gone to Sri Lanka and all these things. But my real involvement became, my interest started with all these as history. To me, the history of Madras was my prime interest originally when I started. But as I went on, researching the history of Madras, I began to be conscious that almost every modern institution in India had its beginnings in Madras. Engineering school, medical school, the whole beginnings had their beginnings. Now, I began to think about this and I said, how can you memorialize this? Yeah, I can put it in paper and say, but how do I memorialize this? And to me, the memorial is in the engineering college's building across the road from you is the memorial to the oldest technical school in Asia. To me, the medical college's anatomy block is the thing of the oldest western-style medical system in India. They became memorials. So they can be memorials going back 200 years or they can go back to memorials 50 years ago to uh, MGR or Kamaraj or somebody like that. So it can be historical importance, it can be architectural importance, uh, it could be an event when we were trying to save this, uh, what is called government house which was pulled down to put up that monstrosity which looks like three oil tanks and is now becoming a hospital of some sort. When we tried to save, our argument was 200 years of Madras history, Madras presidency history and much of Indian history was written in that building. How many acts and laws and all were signed in that building, which affected our lives in one way or another. To me, that was a memorial for that. Not because the building was specially architectural or anything like that. It was good architecture, it's a different aspect. But you can look at all these different things and identify buildings. Open to question, but by and large you say that you have a panel of experts who have decided recently. Yeah. Who lived on that street? names are important. This is the point I'm making. Casa Major, Montiot, most of them were no, not important people. The names were named because they had a house there and nothing else existed and you, the road led to Montiot or it led to Mowbray uh, house or whatever and the name got it. So if you change the name, yes, you're making a historical change because people are used to it as such. No, it was named purely because the road led to that. Yeah, and that, that generated my sense of history. Yeah, that changes your sense of history. Definitely. So, it so will. the moment it's named after something, I no longer be interested about the name if it's just something else. That's right. Except that at the end of the day, you also need to look at, and you can do it in new, new places. You see, there's no point changing Nungamakam High Road, which is the correct name, to Uttamar Gandhi Sale. When you can put Uttamar Gandhi Sale in any new area, the city is growing all over the place. You can put it wherever you want as such. That would be my recommendation that when you change names, put it wherever you want. But changing names really have to be, there must be significance to the name. Gandhi needs a road, yes. Nehru needs a road, yes. Rahul Gandhi needs a road, yes. They are people of significance. Right. Or is it Rajiv Gandhi? <laughs> but yes, all these things are part of history, definitely. I mean, uh, you see, when you look at it, if you begin to look at Chamiya's road, named after where Chamiya stayed, but if you trace the history, you'll find Chamiya was a fairly important person. But on the other hand, Montiath was not. But there were several of those people who were named. But let's look at it the other way. Several of the old people who should have had roads named after them don't have. Where is Francis Day? Where is Berry Timapa? Where is Andrew Cogan, founders of this city? Their names are not remembered anyway. And you can go on. 
Where is Thomas Munro? Is there a Thomas Munro Road anywhere? One of the best governors we ever had, and a man who talked of independence long before anybody else was talking about it. We have a statue at least. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much.